at the risk of trying not to repeat too much of what's been done by my esteemed colleagues before, um, I was asked to uh, uh, give a flavor for some of the, uh, uh, the views from space. My research interests are not necessarily related to um, earthquakes uh, and, and this, the, the, these sorts of events, but the technologies that I use uh, are, are definitely applicable. And I use them in, with my snow and ice hat, um, but we deal with uh, large blocks of ice, large chunks of, of snow, in a way that actually resonates with, with, with some of the, the uh, things you see. So um, that's where I'm coming from. What I wanted to do was to not give you a, just a, a, a litany of uh, the kinds of, of images that you see here. And you've probably seen these sorts of things in, um, uh, on CNN, on the, in the news media. But to try and give you an insight into perhaps some of the other remote sensing, earth observing systems that are out there, that actually give, give us a lot more depth uh, of knowledge uh, in, in terms of what we can do. Um, I have a, a, a cute little animation here that uh, I hope will work. Um, what you're seeing is essentially a constellation of, of Earth observing satellites that is that are essentially managed and run by NASA. This is one of three or four of the main space agencies in, in the world. So NASA, uh, uh, European Space Agency, uh, and the Japanese Space Agency as well. I'll give you some examples of the Japanese work too. And I suppose the fourth, of course, is the Canadian Space Agency. Um, but what, what you're seeing is essentially the, the view from space of perhaps 13 or 14 different, different satellites. We get a synoptic view of the Earth at local to regional scales of resolution with, with these instruments. So we can drill down to about a meter spatial resolution. If you know any CIA agents, you might find that they have better technologies, um, but you won't be able to get hold of them, I'm afraid. <laughs> Um, up to you know, kilometer to tens of kilometer scale of observations. We get near daily coverage of a region. Um, and that's something that I found quite extraordinary with, with this particular event, the, the actual the richness of, of data that's out there and the amount of, it, uh, of analysis that's gone on already in the last just two, two and a bit weeks. Um, and these instruments are, are, are buzzing around about 500 kilometers, 500, 500 to 800 kilometers above the planet to give you a, a sort of sense as to, to, to where they are. And when you combine the kinds of data that we get uh, from the, the, these instruments with, with models and with numerical uh, science type uh, simulations, you get some really interesting stuff. I think Steve has shown a couple of, a couple of examples already. Um, and also, these sorts of the, the previous sort of uh, high resolution uh, uh, data sets do get used for emergency response as well. And I just put a plug in there that this is what we call remote sensing. We're actually observing uh, the Earth from, from space. So, what I thought I would do is just try and pull out a few examples to give you a flavor of the sorts of data that are out there uh, in a kind of a, a, a I suppose, in a, in a synchronous approach from, when the, from the time of the earthquake through the tsunami through what happened. Um, so the earthquake in context, I, I won't dwell on this, to, uh, you've seen this before. And you probably, this was a, a, an early um, uh, figure that came out showing the, uh, the, the foreshock. So I think these are of a higher magnitude than the ones that we saw before. Uh, but you can see them clearly clustered uh, over that subduction zone. What I found really interesting, and these are not remote sensing, but you're, we're using sonar remote sensing data to give you the bathymetry. These are the, the shots on land which, are actually, which have been put against the background of population density. So we're not just seeing a bald earth, we're actually seeing people and place and something related to uh, 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 everyday existence. So you're seeing the darker blue areas, that's where you have higher population uh, patterns. And the reds, the red dots, actually are the, the higher degrees of uh, 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 vibrating Earth that you, you'll see on the ground. So you know, we can do more than just say, well, that's what happened. We actually map them with, with other sorts of data. A big question. How much movement was there? I think, Steve, you, 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 you talked a little bit about that before. And one thing we can do with uh, Earth observing systems is to try to get at that question and not just put dots on maps, but actually produce uh, a discrete map. This is a, a track for a Japanese spacecraft called uh, ALOS, and it has an instrument which is a, a radar system that looks at the Earth and what you're seeing here is just the background. This is just the background uh, uh, terrain. There's the track of where the satellite uh, uh, came. You can see the region here. And to give you an idea of the sorts of data we're looking at, 
This is a, a radar. This is the radar view. We're actually looking at microwave radiation. We're not looking at the sort of optical, visible camera type shots. We're looking at a different part of the spectrum. And if you if you take two of these passes, you can actually start to do some interesting things. What you're seeing in this next slide is actually the amount of of um, uh, movement of the Earth's crust from satellite, from, from radar, so two radar systems. You have one that passes before the event, one that passes after the event, and between the two, the differences that you see, we can recreate, uh, uh, we can actually recreate um, the, uh, the subsidence and the, 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 the plate motion. And I need to make sure I get this straight, but the, uh, what you're seeing here is three and a half, about four meters of movement of that plate towards the east in, in, in terms of, in this direction here, and about a half a meter drop. That is what we're seeing from, what we're able to do from about uh, five, six, seven hundred meters, six, seven hundred kilometers from the Earth's surface. Um, really powerful stuff. To give you a, the corollary, if I step into to my own realm, we use this to do things like look at uh, glacier mo motion and the way that ice streams uh, operate on, on an ice sheet. That's the sort of application. But, there's a direct relevance here as well. What about the tsunami? Okay, so there was a, we know there was an earthquake. What about the tsunami itself? And again, Steve, I think you've preempted me on this one. That's fine. Um, but what you're, what, what you're seeing here is actually um, based on tide gauges around the Pacific Rim. This is actually a model from NOAA uh, where they, they simulated the, uh, the wave fronts. And the scale here is, is quite staggering. You're going from zero meters up to greater than 200, 200 sorry, zero meters, Ten up meters. to 240, 2.4 meters, yeah, um, which I must admit, surprised, it's surprisingly, surprisingly they did it centimeters given it's the US and they normally do things in inches down there. But anyway, what you're seeing here is uh, in excess of 2.4 meters and we know that it was of the order of 10 meters. They're actually doing a pretty reasonable job. This is the, the wavefront, and these are the, the, uh, the, the, the large uh, uh, wavefronts moving out. And you know, this is the first time I think I've ever seen a map like this. I think it's absolutely stunning that with that uh, amount of, of, of detail, uh, you can map the, the, the wave heights across this huge Pacific uh, uh, basin. Okay, so the, the, the earthquake, the, the, the tsunami hit. We then had flooding, and what you're seeing one of the things, again, I'll go to my microwave instrument rather than my optical instrument. Uh, I'll go to my, my microwave instrument, and you're looking at the areas of blue here, which are the flooded areas. Uh, this, this scene was taken the day after the, the uh, tsunami hit. There's a, a, a blow up of it, I think, over here, and uh, you're, you're, you can pick out the areas of blue are flooded, but also what's interesting with these radar, radar images is you can see the areas of flooding, but there is some uh, magenta areas, some, some purpley pink areas, which are, um, let's make sure I get this straight. Um, these are, the purpley pink are areas of debris, actual debris that's been pushed up by the tsunami. And you can see over here, there's some light blue cyan coloring in there. Those are, uh, those are damaged infrastructure buildings. So we're able to actually see not just flooding, but we actually can start to look at places where there's more or, 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 or distinguish between different types of, of uh, features on the ground. This is, uh, uh, again, I think Steve showed a couple of these already. These are, these are the sort of the classic uh, uh, time-lapse uh, shots from space. Um, you're looking at uh, a region north of uh, Sendai here, I, I believe, and what we're able to pick out is flood, flood water up here. If I flip between the two, it comes out quite nicely. That is two kilometers, so you're looking at about 10 kilometers up, up, upstream here uh, in terms of what we're observing. And uh, another one, which again is, is interesting because although we're seeing the regions of flooding, we're also seeing these massive areas of debris uh, from space, they shot really well. So think about the fact that it's not just water that's being pushed up, but it's actually the, the, these huge debris flows in areas that perhaps weren't, uh, which perhaps you wouldn't see on CNN or on, on CBC. 
If you go down to the, the local context, that tends to be the kinds of uh, uh, CNN, uh, CPC type uh, scenes that you see. These are, are pretty <coughs> incredible, the, the, the amount of destruction that, that, that we, we've observed. Um, we're looking at about uh, half a meter resolution here from, uh, from space. And the nice thing about these particular ones, and this is the first time we've been able to do this for, for this kind of event, because the instruments we're using are actually steerable. In other words, it means that they're, they're buzzing around in the same orbital plane, but the instrument can actually be programmed to look out much further. You can target particular places, which for mapping these, these, these events is, is uh, significant. Uh, another example from uh, uh, Ishinomaki uh, there, uh, again, complete devastation and inundation by this flood water. Those are the sorts of, uh, you know, uh, I think, very graphic I I examples that we've, we've become accustomed to. What about some human dimensions of taking this information and, and mapping it to, to other sorts of data and using other sorts of data? Well, if you couple the flooding, flooded inundation areas with uh, the estimated directly affected inhabitants, you can start to build up a picture of where, where the de more densely populated regions are relative to the inundation. So 4,000 to 6,200 people per kilometer squared. So these are the, 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 the dense areas here, uh, uh, and the less densely populated regions here, still, you know, complete uh, uh, decimation. Um, and my second to last slide, this one I think is, is, is quite striking as well. This is, uh, again, another satellite uh, view of the Earth at night time. You may have seen some of the nighttime lights that, uh, 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 of, the, of the world. This is a zoom in on, uh, on Japan. You can make out the, the outline of, of Honshu. And what you're seeing is that essentially a time series of before and after. And the areas of red, well, these are nighttime lights. These are what, what a spacecraft would see at nighttime. And you're seeing the illumination from Tokyo, um, there's Nagoya, I think we've got Osaka there uh, as well. And there's Sendai. And the difference between the yellow and the red, the red is after the, uh, the event happened, occurred, and when the lights went out. And you're seeing that change in reflectance uh, from before to after. So you can see, essentially, no, no power. Think of the red as being no power, I'm afraid. I had to get one in on snow. <laughs> But again, you know, what we can do is we can we routinely map snow, and that's why one of the things I do globally. And this is just to illustrate the sorts of uh, uh, things that people have to deal with in these environments. This is snow cover uh, about 10 days ago now, um, and it impacts these areas up here, which were were, were hit uh, by by earthquake activity. So. These are the sorts of things that, that we can do, and I think there's a lot more than just the before and after that um, uh, kind of uh, qualitative views you get. There's a huge amount of stuff out there. Um, I could probably put this on a website somewhere for those who are interested in exploring it further. But I think, again, one of the things that uh, is extraordinary is the amount of information that's out there and the amount of you know, early analysis that's already been done on, on these data sets, and it's been made publicly available too. So, thank you.